Hey guys, um, seems like we've got some good news. We might be getting to go back to school soon. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys keep them well, enjoying the good weather, um, and enjoying the story. Hope you like this new one. To some extent, decided to wear a blanket this time for the video. Felt like spicing things up, I guess. So we're on to chapter three of the horse and his boy. And this is At the Gates of Tashban. My name, said the girl once, is Aravis Tarkina, and I am the only daughter of Kidrash Tarkan, the son of Rishti Tarkan, the son of Kidrash Tarkan, the son of Ilsombrech Tizrak, the son of Ardip Tizrak, who was descended in a right line from the god Tash. My father is the lord of the province of Calabar, and is one who has the right of standing on his, on his feet in his shoes before the face of the Tisrock himself. May he live forever. My mother, on whom may be the peace, on whom be the peace of the gods, is dead, and my, and my father has married another wife. One of my brothers has fallen in battle against the rebels in the far west, and the other is a child. Now it came to pass that my father's wife, my stepmother, hated me, and the sun appeared dark in her eyes as long as I lived in my father's house. And so she persuaded my father to promise me in marriage to Ahoshta Tarkan. Now this Ahoshta is of base birth, though in these latter years he has won the favour of the Tisrock, may he live forever, by flattery and evil counsels, and is now made a Tarkan and the lord of many cities, and is likely to be chosen as the Grand Vizier, when the present Grand Vizier dies. Moreover, he is at least 60 years old and has a hump on his back and his face resembles that of an ape. Nevertheless, my father, because of the wealth and power of this Ahoshta and being persuaded by his wife, sent messengers offering me in marriage and the offer was favorably accepted and Ahoshta sent word that he would marry me this very year at the, high, at the time of high summer. When this news was brought to me, the sun appeared dark in my eyes, and I laid myself on my bed and wept for a day. But on the second day, I rose up and washed my face, and caused my mare Quinn to be saddled, and took with me a sharp dagger which my brother had carried in the western wars, and rode out alone. When my father's house was out of sight, and I come to a green open place, and I was come to a green open place in a certain wood where there were no dwellings of men, I dismounted from Quinn, my mare, and took the dagger. Then I parted my clothes where I thought the readiest way lay to my heart, and I prayed to all the gods that as soon as I was dead I might find myself with my brother. After that I shut my eyes and my teeth and prepared to drive the dagger into my heart. Before I had done so this mare spoke with the voice of one of the daughters of men and said, O oh my mistress, do not by any means destroy yourself, for if you live you may yet have good fortune, but all dead are dead alike. I didn't say it half so well as that, muttered the mare. Hush, ma'am, hush, said Bree, who was thoroughly enjoying the story. She's telling it in the grand Calamine manner, and no storyteller is in Tish Tisrock's court could do it better. Pray go on, Tarkina. When I heard the language of men uttered by my mare, continued Aravis, I said to myself, the fear of death has disordered my reason and subjected me to delusions, and I became full of shame, for none of my lineage ought to fear death more than the biting of a gnat. Therefore I addressed myself a second time to the stabbing, but Huynh came near to me and put her head in between me and the dagger and discoursed to me most excellent reasons and rebuked me as a mother rebukes her daughter. And now my wonder was so great that I forgot about killing myself and about Ahostra and said, Oh, my mare, how have you learned to speak like one of the daughters of men? And Huynh told me that what is and Huynh told me what is known to all this company, that in Narnia there are beasts that talk, and how she herself was stolen from thence when she was a little foal. She told me also of the woods and waters of Narnia and the castles and the great ships, till I said, in the name of Tash and Azaroth and Zardina, Lady of the Night, I have a great wish to be in that country of Narnia. Oh, my mistress, answered the mayor. If you were in Narnia, you would be happy, for in that land no maiden is forced to marry against her will. And when we had talked together for a great time, hope returned to me, and I rejoiced that I had not killed myself. 
Moreover, it was agreed between Huynh and me that we should steal ourselves away together, and we planned it in this fashion. We returned to my father's house, and I put on my gayest clothes and sang and danced before my father and pretended to be delighted with the marriage which he had prepared for me. Also, I said to him, O oh, my father, and O oh, the delight of my eyes, give me your license and permission to go with one of my maidens alone for three days into the woods to do secret sacrifices to Ardine, Sardina, Lady of the Night and of Maidens, as is proper and customary for damsels when they must bid farewell to the service of Sardina and prepare themselves for marriage. And he answered, O oh, my daughter, and O oh, the delight of my eyes, so shall it be. But when I came out from the presence of my father, I went immediately to the oldest of his slaves, his secretary, who had dandled me on his knees when I was a baby and loved me more than the air and the light. And I swore him to be secret and begged him to write a certain letter for me. And he wept and implored me to change my resolution. But in the end, he said, to hear is to obey and did all my will. And I sealed the letter and hid it in my bosom. And what was in the letter? asked Shasta. Be quiet, youngster, said Bree. You're spoiling the story. She'll tell us all about the letter in the right place. Go on, Tarkina. Tar Tar when I called the maid who was to go with me to the woods and perform the rites of Zardina, and told her to wake me very early in the morning, and I became merry with her and gave her wine to drink, but I had mixed such things in her cup that I knew she must sleep for a night and a day. As soon as the household of my father had committed themselves to sleep, I arose and put on an armour of my brother's, which I always kept in my chamber in his memory. I put into my girdle all the money I had and certain choice jewels, and provided myself also with food, and saddled the mare with my own hands, and rode away in the second watch of the night. I directed my course not to the woods where my father supposed that I would go, but north and east to Tashban. Now for three days and more I knew that my father would not seek me, being deceived by the words I had said to him. And on the fourth day we arrived at the city of Azim Balda. Now Azim Balda stands at the meeting of many roads, and from it the posts of the Tisrak, may he live forever, ride on swift horses to every part of the empire. And it is one of the rights and privileges of the greater Tarkans to send messages by them. I therefore went to the chief of the messengers in the house of imperial posts in Azim Balda and said, O oh, dispatcher of messages, here is a letter from my uncle Ahoshta Tarkan to Kidrash Tarkan, Lord of Kalavar. Take now these five crescents and cause it to be sent to him. And the chief of the messengers said, to hear is to obey. This letter was feigned to be written by Ahoshta, and this was the significance of the writing. Ahoshta Tarkan to Kidrash Tarkan. Salutation and peace. In the time of Tash the Irresistible, the Inexorable, be it known to you that as I made my journey towards your house to perform the contract of marriage between me and your daughter, Aravis Tarkina, it pleased fortune and the gods that I fell in with her in the forest when she had ended the rites and sacrifices of Zardina according to the custom of maidens. And when I learned who she was, being delighted with her beauty and discretion, I became inflamed with love, and it appeared to me that the sun would be dark to me if I did not marry her at once. Accordingly, I prepared the necessary sacrifices and married your daughter the same hour that I met her and returned with her to my own house. And we both pray and charge you to come hither as speedily as you may that we may be delighted with your face and speech, and also that you may bring with you the dowry of my wife, which, by reason of my great charges and expenses, I require without delay. And because thou and I are brothers, I assure you, I assure myself that you will not be angered by the haste of my marriage, which is wholly occasioned by the great love I bear your daughter, and I commit you to the care of all the gods. As soon as I had done this, I rode on in all haste from Azim Balda, fearing no pursuit and expecting that my father, having received such a letter, would send messages to Ahoshta or go to him himself, and that before the matter was discovered, I should be, on, I should be beyond Tashban. And that is the pith of my story until this very night when I was chased by lions and met you at the swimming of the salt water. And what happened to the girl, the one you drugged? asked Shasta. Doubtless she was beaten for sleeping late, said Aravis coolly, but she was a tool and a spy of my stepmother's. I am very glad they should beat her. I say that was hardly fair, said Shasta. I did not do any of these things for the sake of pleasing you, said Aravis. And there's another thing I don't understand about that story, said Shasta. You're not grown up. I don't believe you're any older than I am. I don't believe you're as old. I don't believe you're as old. How could you be getting married at your age? Aravis said nothing. Bree at once said, 
Shasta, don't, ex don't display your ignorance. They're always married at that age in the great Tarkan families. Shasta turned very red, though it was hardly light enough for the others to see this, and felt snubbed. Aravis asked Bree for his story. Bree told it, and Shasta thought that he put in a great deal more than he needed about the falls and the bad riding. Bree obviously thought it very funny, but Aravis did not laugh. When Bree had finished, they all went to sleep. The next day, all four of them, two horses and two humans, continued their journey together. Shasta thought it had been much, ple thought it had been much pleasanter when he and Bree were on their own. For now, it was Bree and Aravis who did nearly all the talking. Bree had lived a long time in Calamen and had, and had always been among Tarkans and Tarkans' horses. And so, of course, he knew a great many of the same people and places that Aravis knew. She would always be saying things like, But if you were at the fight of Zulindra, you would have seen my cousin Alimash. And Bree would answer, Oh yes, Alimash. He was only captain of the chariots, you know. I don't quite hold with the chariots, or the kind of horses who draw chariots. That's not real cavalry. But he is a worthy nobleman. He filled my nose bag with sugar after the taking of Tibet. Or else Bree would say, I was down at the lake of Mesreel that summer. And Aravis would say, Oh, Mesreel, I had a friend there, Lasaraline Tarkina. What a delightful place it is, those gardens and the valley of the thousand perfumes. Bree was not in the least trying to leave Shasta out of things, though Shasta sometimes nearly thought he was. People who know a lot of the same things can hardly help talking about them, and if you're there, you can hardly help feeling that you're out of it. Quinn the mare was rather shy before a great warhorse like Bree and said very little, and Aravis never spoke to Shasta at all if she could help it. Soon, however, they had more important things to think of. They were getting near Tashban. There were more and larger villages and more people on the roads. They now did nearly all their travelling by night and hid as best as they could during the day. And at every halt they argued and argued about what, what they were to do when they reached Tashban. Everyone had been putting off this difficulty, but now it could be put off no longer. During these discussions, Aravis became a little, a very little, less unfriendly to Shasta. One usually gets on better with people when one is making plans than when one is talking about nothing in particular. Bree said the first thing now was to fix a place where they would all promise to meet on the far side of Tashban, even if, by any ill luck, they got separated in passing the city. He said the best place would be the tombs of the ancient kings on the very edge of the desert. Things like great stone beehives, he said, you can't possibly miss them. And the best of it is that none of the Calamines will go near them because they think the place is haunted by ghouls and are afraid of it. Aravis asked if it wasn't really haunted by ghouls, but Bree said he was a free Narningen horse and didn't believe in these Calamine tales. And then Shasta said he wasn't a Calamine either and didn't care a straw about these old stories of ghouls. This wasn't quite true, but it rather impressed Aravis, though at the moment it annoyed her too. And of course she said she didn't mind any number of ghouls either. So it was settled that the tombs should be their assembly place on the other side of Tashban, and everyone felt they were getting on very well, till Quinn humbly pointed out that the real problem was not where they should go when they had got through Tashban, but how they were to get through it. We'll settle that tomorrow, ma'am, said Bree. Time for a little sleep now. But it wasn't easy to settle. Aravis's first suggestion was that they should swim across the river below the city during the night and not go into Tashban at all. But Bree had two reasons against this. One was that the river mouth was very wide and it would be far too long a swim for Quinn to do, especially with a rider on her back. He thought it would be too long for himself too, but he said much less about that. The other was that it would be full of shipping, and of course anyone on the deck of, sh of a ship who saw two horses swimming past would be almost certain to be inquisitive. Shasta thought they should go up the river above Tashban and cross it where it was narrower, but Bree explained that there were gardens and pleasure houses on both banks of the river for miles, and that there would be Tarkans and Tarkinas living in them and riding about the roads and having water parties on the river. In fact, it would be the most likely place in the world for meeting someone who would recognise Aravis, or even himself. We'll have to have a disguise, said Shasta. Quinn said it looked to her as if the safest thing was to go right through the city itself, from gate to gate, because no one was less likely to be noticed in the crowd. 
because one was less likely to be noticed in the crowd. But she approved of the idea of disguise as well. She said, both the humans will have to dress in rags and look like peasants or slaves, and all Aravis's armour and our saddles and things must be made into bundles and put on our backs, and the children just pretend to drive us, and people will think we're only pack horses. My dear Huynh, said Aravis rather scornfully, as if anyone could mistake Bree for anything but a war horse, however you disguised him. I should think not indeed, said Bree, snorting and letting his ears go ever slightly back. I know it's not a very good plan, said Huynh, but I think it's our only chance, and we haven't been groomed for ages, and we're not looking quite ourselves, at least I'm sure I'm not. I do think if we get well plastered with mud and go along with our heads down as if we're tired and lazy and don't lift our hooves hardly at all, we might not be noticed. And our tails ought to be cut shorter, not neatly, you know, but all ragged. My dear ma'am, said Bree, have you pictured to yourself how very disagreeable it would be to arrive in Narnia in that condition? Well, said Huynh humbly, she was a very sensible mare, the main thing is to get there. Though nobody much liked it, it was Huynh's plan which had to be adopted in the end. It was a troublesome one and involved a certain amount of what Shasta called stealing and Bree called raiding. One farm lost a few sacks that evening and another lost a coil of rope the next, but some tattered old boy's clothes for Aravis to wear had to be fairly bought and paid for in a village. Shasta returned with them in triumph just as evening was closing in. The others were waiting for him among the trees at the foot of a low range of wooded hills which lay right across their path. Everyone was feeling excited because this was the last hill. When they reached the ridge at the top, they would be looking down at Tashban. I do wish we were safely past it, muttered Shasta to Huynh. Oh, I do, I do, said Huynh fervently. That night they wound their way through the woods up to the ridge by a woodcutter's track. And when they came out of the woods at the top, they could see thousands of lights in the valley below them. Shasta had, no, Shasta had had no notion of what a great city would be like, and it frightened him. They had their supper, and the children got some sleep, but the horses woke them very early in the morning. The stars were still out, and the grass was terribly cold and wet, but daybreak was just beginning, far to their right across the sea. Aravis went a few steps away into the wood and came back looking odd in her new ragged clothes and carrying her real ones in a bundle. These and her armour and shield and scimitar and the two saddles and the rest of the horse's fine furnishings were put into the sacks. Bree and Huynh had already got themselves as dirty and bedraggled as they could and it remained to shorten their tails. As the only tool for doing this was Aravis's scimitar, one of the packs had to be undone again in order to get it out. It was a longish job and rather hurt the horses. My word, said Bree, if I wasn't a talking horse but a lovely kick in the face I could give you. I thought you were going to cut it, not pull it out. That's what it feels like. But in spite of semi-darkness and cold fingers, all was done in the end. The big packs bound on the horses, the rope halters, which they were now wearing instead of bridles and reins, in the children's hands, and the journey began. Remember, said Bree, keep together if we possibly can. If not, meet at the tombs of the ancient kings, and whoever gets there first must wait for the others. And remember, said Shasta, don't you two horses forget yourselves and start talking, whatever happens. That's the end of chapter three.